Hello, it's John Heaton, and today I'm not going to talk about the third anniversary of McCartney 3, which is coming up shortly, and all the pointless coloured vinyl variations which are being released in association with that. Uh, quite frankly, I'm speechless. The, McCartney's camp, and I, d I don't excuse him from the blame, has reached a new low with this. Um, not worth doing a video on, suffice to say I won't be buying any of it anyway. If you're looking for ideas for Christmas, rather than go down that route, Here's an idea. Um, this book on the Beatles, Act Naturally, uh, The Beatles on Film, by Steve Matteo, who's kind enough to send me a copy, and it basically covers all of their stuff they did in the 60s on film, Hard Day's Night, Help, Magical Mystery Tour, Yellow Submarine, and Let It Be. And uh, it just goes through, more or less chronologically, and gives detail about who was involved, um, the actors, the directors, um, and then actually the most interesting bit for me is how they actually filmed the various films, what the locations were and who was involved and, and a little bit of who thought what about each movie, which is interesting, what the critics thought. Um, so we'll just go through some of my thoughts. A Hard Day's Night, we'll start off with A Hard Day's Night and he, he, Steve does a good job in kind of, sort of depicting the background to this movie, you know, the fact that... Um, independent television had come in in 1955 in the UK which kind of loosens things a bit and we had various films like uh, The Servant and the, Thir the, the Third Man and Tom Jones just before this one and um, sort of all of them set the scene and then obviously the James Bond films which started I think in 63 with Thunderball could have been 62 but I think it was 63 um, so that that kind of set the scene for, for the Beatles to make a movie. Um, although James Bond has nothing to do with music and maybe that was more of an inspiration for help, think, come to think of it. But um, anyway, um, interestingly in, in Hard Day's Night there was a lot of footage shot in Liverpool um, which wasn't used and I guess it's been junked because in those days the tape was very expensive and the BBC threw stuff out and I don't know if the, the film company who made Hard Day's Night would have done something similar. It's a shame if that's the case because by all accounts they shot some, well Steve talks about it in the book, they shot some very interesting sequences in Admiral Grove where Ringo lived, all four of them, and Ringo coming out of the house and getting into a car and it would have been brilliant to see that, but especially if you could see the Empress Pub, which featured on the Sentimental Journey cover. Um, but anyway, it wasn't used. Um, Steve talks about a deluxe edition in 2000. I don't even believe I have that. I'm not even sure if I saw it when it came out. I'll have to check it out because there's loads of interviews and, and commentaries and stuff. Not too much bonus footage, though, apparently, because um, maybe it doesn't exist. But maybe one of these days we're going to get a huge box set of all the Hard Day's Night outtakes and the Help outtakes, that would be great. Um, by the way, just on a side note, the man on the train who, who wanted the window closed and the, the Beatles wanted it open all the other way around, um, I fought the war for people like you. That guy turned up in Duchess of Duke Street, I was watching it the other day, which is a BBC thing of the mid-70s kind of answer to um, Upstairs, downstairs, and he was a main character in that. I thought that was quite interesting. Anyway, I digress. So other interesting tidbits here. I'll Get You was planned to be recorded in German before they decided to go with I Wanna Hold Your Hand. That would have been interesting, although maybe two German language songs is enough. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Capital wanted <coughs> Roll Over Beethoven to be released as the new single rather than Can't Buy Me Love. George Martin talked them out of it, happily. Um, there's performances which I didn't know the Beatles had made or I'd forgotten, like miming to an empty studio in Shepherd's Bush for Can't Buy Me Love and You don't, Can't Do That to avoid going to Manchester to record Top of the Pops. That was interesting. And also Ready, St Ready Steady Go, uh, another miming session where they did Can't Buy Me Love, You Can't Do That, and it won't be long. I don't think I've ever seen that. I don't know if it exists. Probably not. Probably been junked. Um, what else have we got? Uh, yeah, the film, the, for the concert sequence, you know there's all those fans in the audience. Well, apparently they came from the Central School of Speech and Drama, and because it was a film, guess what? They all got paid. So can you imagine being a Beatles fan in 64? Not only did you get to go and see your idols, but you got paid for it as well. It's not a bad deal. Maureen Cleave, interesting story of her being showed the original lyrics to A Hard Day's Night, which includes... Um, 
And when I get home to you, I find my tiredness is through. And Maureen said, that's a bit of a weak line. And John said, OK, crossed it out and replaced it with, I find the things that you do, <laughs> which is a vast improvement, obviously. So that was Hard Day's Night. Moving on to help. Um, I just love all of the footage in the Bahamas. Um, but just before we get to that, Dick Lester was saying, the, the, the talk about the difficulty from transforming a hard day's night into help. To me, it was the only way we could deal with what we had available to us. We didn't want to make a hard day's night in color. We didn't want to do a film about their private lives because it would have been X-rated. We therefore took the decision, rightly or wrongly, that we should find a story that attacked the four and use the story as a device to try and show them as they were in 1965. This, as you probably know, led John Lennon to say very kindly, we're extras in our own bloody film. Well, in defense of Dick Lester, I would say that, you know, the Beatles probably weren't helping the situation by being on marijuana for breakfast in those days and being in a fit of giggles, which made it very difficult to film anything at all, especially after lunch. Um, so th the fact that they got that movie done, and again, it would be fascinating to see all the extras where they were just collapsing in giggles. I mean, uh, I wouldn't mind betting they've been deleted, but it would be great if they haven't. Um, they got a private jet to the Bahamas uh, for the film sequences filmed there, which is in February of 65. And because it was a private jet, they could all get stoned on the jet. And they even landed at New York Airport where they could just sit on the runway unbothered and then fly straight onto the Bahamas. Um, so that's quite interesting considering how strict the uh, anti-drug laws were in America and in Britain, I think it's amazing they were able to do that. Um, Balmoral Island, Balmoral Club in Nassau, which is in Cable Beach, very close to where my school friend Denisio lives or lived and still lives, um, and where he's very close to where his parents had a house. And that's where they filmed uh, bits of the movie in Balmoral Island, which is just off the coast of, um, of um, Nassau, is is um, a private island. I don't think it's much on it apart from rocks, and that's where they filmed another girl. Anyway, we, when I was there with my sons in 2016, we tried to go to this Belmoral Club, which is now called Sandals Royal Bahamian Hotel, but and take my kids to, to walk around and have a look, but we couldn't because there was a law saying no under 18s are allowed, not even to go into the bar or have a meal at the restaurant. So that was, uh, our plans were scuppered that day. Um, let me see, what else have we got? Um, August 65, I didn't know this, uh, Ed Sullivan, they did an Ed Sullivan show, well, I'd forgotten it, where they performed, not just, I remember them filming yesterday, but they also filmed I Feel Fine, I'm Down, Act Naturally, Ticket to Ride, uh, yesterday, and Help. Um, so I don't think that's been av available publicly on a release. So, you know, there's so we think just when we think we've scraped the bottom of the barrel, when we realize there's all this other stuff out there, it's just ridiculous. And then on November the 23rd, 1965, they did all the, all the black and white videos for not only the new single, which was coming out shortly, We Can Work It Out, Day Tripper, but also promotional videos for Ticket to Ride, Help, I Feel Fine, and two versions of um, I Feel Fine, three versions of We Can Work It Out, two versions of Day Trip, all filmed at Twickenham, uh, directed by Joe McGrath, and all on the one day, which I found very interesting. So moving on to Magical Mystery Tour. Well, I think the most interesting bit for me is the, the description in the book of all the stuff they did at uh, Maidstone in Kent, the West Morning um, aerodrome area um, which has now completely been demolished you, you, if you try and go down to that area now you won't find anything reminiscent of uh, the 67 shots like the concrete walls and I think the aerodrome's gone and everything anyway um, some interesting bits in the book about um, George using the Fender Stratocaster painted in Dago, Dago colors uh, he did it on the walrus video here and he did it in the all you need is love video um, so those are the two times it's been shown, um, which is nice. And also there's an uncredited camera operator um, in Magical Mystery Tour who said at the, the filming of Your Mother Should Know at the end, the generator packed up and um, they had to wait a couple of hours for it to be fixed. Anyway, th this is Michael's reminiscent of that day, all of that, of that whole period. Such different energy from the typical well-organized hierarchical, hierarchical film business. I loved it. 
such great lateral and free energy. I don't recall any particular direction. <laughs> Shots and sequences seem to just evolve. As we filmed it, and we filmed it, in many ways, the whole project was the antithesis of conventional filmmaking, which I found stimulating. Not too sure too many others in the crew did. It was an experimental home movie, I guess. Paul was the most intense and interested in getting all the material we required. My one abiding memory is on the last evening, a huge generator broke down and we had to wait hours for two replacements. All the dancers in the final number wanted to leave. I recall John saying to the others, we better get, get out there, sign a few autographs and entertain them or we'll lose them and we won't complete the number. The others agreed and wandered out. The dozens of dancers remained and we completed the sequence. Well, you would if you're going to get to meet the Beatles, you're going to stay, no matter if it was cold and miserable. Um, so that's a nice little story. Um, also, Steve points out um, uh, that the mono and stereo versions of Mystery Tour, there's little differences which I need to go back and, and uh, discover because I don't recall um, seeing, uh, sort of hearing too many differences on Fool on the Hill, for example, but I'm mean, going to go back and rediscover. And the interesting observation from Steve on page 203 here, when looking back on photos or film footage that was not actually used in Magical Mystery Tour of the Beatles shooting at various locations along the way, one is struck by how easily uh, fans were able to interact with the Beatles, and the Beatles didn't seem put off by it at all. In many photos and film, they seem friendly, allowing autographs and photographs, and generally seem relaxed. So that's a good observation. Um, moving on to Yellow Submarine, I thought it was interesting that the Eleanor Rigby sequence is um, included sort of several members of the film crew depicted as, you know, the, the man in the telephone box and the guy with the crash helmet on and all, and there's literally seven or eight people from the film crew or the... the um, to, the whole, yeah, the film crew depicted by the animators as a kind of in-joke. I thought that was interesting. The comments from George Harrison um, when he was at the premiere, or just before the premiere, it was a kind of press screening. And uh, he's saying at the time, the Yellow Submarine cartoon depiction of the Beatles isn't us, George told the press. That's not a true image of us. You press people have given us an image which isn't us either. His attitude had mellowed, mellowed by the time of his interview for the Beatles anthology book when he said, I like the film, I think it's a classic. That film works for every generation, every baby, every three or four year, years old goes through Yellow Submarine. So that's interesting to see how George changed his mind. Um, good information about the premiere that they all turned up with their wives, apart from Paul, who was on his own because he'd just split with Jane Asher. Um, Princess Margaret attend her third, attended her third consecutive Beatles premiere. Um, and also, interestingly, a Pink Panther cartoon was shown before the, the, the movie so to kick things off. I thought well, that was interesting. So, moving on to Let It Be. Well, uh, we've got page 277. I've highlighted a, a bit. Uh, yeah, where um, basically... Steve's talking about whether Let It Be could have been filmed on the roof and whether the studio songs recorded on the 31st are a bit of a come down after the rooftop. And he says, Let It Be does have some rock muscle and might have also made for a good, good rooftop performance. But the dark setting and more somber songs make for a bit of a letdown after the joyous rooftop concert. Well, minor kind of correction there, Steve. Um, Peter Jackson's film is chronological, so you're right, the two of us and Long and Winding Road stuff when the credits roll is after the concert and is a bit anticlimactic, but in my opinion it's anticlimactic because they didn't show everything. They just show bits and what they should have done is what Michael Lindsay Hogg did and put those songs, schedule them before the rooftop. Uh, all three songs, two of us, Long and Winding Road, Let It Be, all appear in the movie before the rooftop and then the movie quite rightly concludes with the rooftop. Um, so I think that's the right way to have done it, but obviously Jackson could do that, couldn't do that because he was taking it chronologically. So I guess also a reason for Jackson not including the, the whole songs is because he wanted, he was hoping that the original Let It Be movie would come out at some stage and was still waiting, oh dear. Um, so that, uh, Chris O'Dell, page 276 is interesting. She said, the roof has been a very strong memory for me. However, sometimes I wonder 
if I've underplayed it in my mind or in my memory. Of course, at the time, you never thought that that concert would live on so long or be seen so many times. From memory of the temperature, the coldness outside is extremely strong, but seeing the documentary reminded me of what it was like that day to be sitting on the roof. I must admit, I definitely today feel like one of the lucky people. I also have to say that the Beatles sounded really good that day. That's nice to hear. Um, Alistair Taylor, some good, very good first-hand interviews here with primary sources. So Alistair Taylor, who left, unfortunately, under a bit of a cloud uh, with, when Alan Klein came in. Um, what have we got? 269, sorry. Let's find it in a sec. Uh, he says, George was the most rounded personality and truly wonderful person to be around. He tried to teach me the sitar and I imported the very first Moog synth synthesizer into the UK for him. My favourite memory of George involves Mary Hopkin. She was recording and during a break, George whispered to something to Mal Evans, who immediately went off on some errand or other. Fifteen minutes later, he strode into the studio and presented her with a Martinez acoustic guitar, one of the finest guitars in the world. This is from George. Isn't that a nice story? Isn't that a nice story? Um, so then we got um, Michael Lindsay Hogg talking about Peter Jackson and being very complimentary. Um, there were a couple of things I couldn't or didn't put in Let It Be, which Peter was able to use and get back. I thought he told a long and complicated story with diligence and insight and kindness to all. From the moment I met Peter in January 2020 in Los Angeles, I really straight out liked him. He's good humoured with an enthusiastic brain which works at a rapid pace. He asked me to tell him the story of Let It Be as I got, uh, as I got to the end, which was about the Beatles having broken up just before its release and how I was dealing myself with United Artists since no one else was. He said, so except for you, Let It Be was really an orphan. It was, but I'd never heard that particular word applied to it before and I knew then that Peter had another quality, empathy. So that's really nice to hear. Um, then a couple of other good bits. We've got um, Ian McMillan, who took the cover shoot of Abbey Road. Um, he was given a check for his troubles, 750 quid, which he cashed to pay his rent. And he said it was signed, that check was signed by John Lennon and Paul McCartney. And so he, he said he was an idiot for cashing it. But how was he to know, I suppose? That was a good story. And also Klaus Vormann, um, some translations of bits of his German language autobiography, which has never been translated into English, um, to support the Innocent Karma story. And um, basically, he basically said that they came into the studio, there was no small talk, no cup of tea. George sat, John just sat down at the piano and went straight into it. And uh, with very little effort, um, they, they recorded the track. And that's a good good bit of inside information there. So on the whole, this, this is a really readable, book with a lot of interesting facts and I like the way Steve is is rightly dismissive of the US Beatles albums with the exception of Mystery Tour which is obviously uh, superior to the UK EP um, but unlike a lot of US fans who just stick, stick up for the US albums because that's what they grew up with um, Steve is is quite objective in that and I think I applaud him for that so I, I think this is a decent book and also there's a few good photos in here and there's one photo which I'm not even sure if I'd seen, maybe I had, but I, I couldn't remember because it's um, from the 22nd of August 69, last photo session, a picture of the four Beatles with Yoko and Linda on either side of them, which I, I thought was, I, maybe I've seen it before, but anyway, it's great to see that. So thank you, Steve, for that book and, and thank you for watching, everyone, and we'll see you next time.